Welcome everyone to Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. We've made it. The end of 2020 is in sight. God help us all. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we have Robert C. Cooper, executive producer, writer, director of Stargate on for part two of his episode in just a moment here. But before we bring him in, if you like Stargate and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, it would mean a great deal if you click the like button. It really makes a difference with YouTube's algorithm and will definitely help the show grow its audience. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. Giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops, and you'll get my notifications of any last-minute guest changes. This is key if you plan on watching live. Clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next few days and weeks on both the Dial the Gate and GateWorld.net YouTube channels. So before we bring Robert in for this uh, pre-recorded episode, uh, just a quick run of show. So interspersed throughout the episode, I have fan questions submitted. A lot of fans, uh, thank you so much, submitted questions about the end of, S of SGA and SGU. Uh, we need to keep in mind that... Robert left SGU before season two was over. So a lot of those directions that the show was going to go, he was already moved on in, in his creative head for other projects. So those are not really necessarily questions that he can answer because he wasn't going that, that way with his, with his creative thought process anymore. And he was moving on to other projects. And he's going to talk a little bit about this, this episode as well. But before I get any, any emails about why wasn't my question asked, I want to make sure that you understand that uh, we had to keep it to the context of, of, uh, of Rob Cooper and his uh, relationship uh, with Stargate at the end of its run, because a lot of those questions he's not able to answer, I including with Atlantis, too. Even though he was around, Joseph Malazzi and Paul Mully uh, were really the executive producers running the show for seasons four and five. So uh, please keep that in mind. And uh, if we're lucky enough to have him, him back next time around, uh, keep uh, asking him questions uh, regarding uh, episodes that he helmed, that he wrote, that he directed, and I'm sure we'll get some uh, really cool answers from him. So without further ado, let's go back in time a little bit for me at least, future for you, and bring in Robert C. Cooper. Robert C. Cooper, welcome back to the show, sir. Thank you so much for joining me. It's a pleasure. You're welcome. We were just talking about a little bit before the show um, about the volume of content that you put out. And one of the things that you brought up that I thought was kind of interesting was, you know, when 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 you go into a project like Stargate or like anything else, you don't expect to do 360 hours of it. You know, I, I mean, how do you how do you do anything else afterwards without f fear of ripping your or consciously? Oh, I've done that. I've done that. You know, ripping yourself off. How do you how do you approach that? No one oh, goes in to do 360 hours of a franchise. At the beginning, you know, when we got a 44 episode order at the off the top, and then partway through season one, Showtime picked the show up for another 44, and we had essentially an 88 episode order. I mean, that was almost even unheard of at that time. And also pretty, you know, look, it created a luxury for us. We knew we, we had a, a long road and that we could develop and you know, thankfully, frankly, the show had a few uh, bumps along the way in, in the beginning, and, and I think it took a little while to really find itself. And thankfully, we had that you know runway to um, uh, to make the show into what it eventually became. I don't think I'm betraying too much uh, here. The you know, Brad and I often in the process were like, ah maybe we're done <laughs> and 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 in a way try you know kind of tried to end the show you know in in you know I, i've told this story before i think i think it's been told before that the original plan was to end sg1 uh in season seven and and use the ending to launch atlantis and it was only because uh sci-fi at the time which was our new our sort of newish network uh, <laughs> uh, wanted both shows. And 
So, yeah, I mean, when you've done that many episodes, that many seasons, uh, it is difficult to not repeat yourself or uh, come up with new ideas. I mean, there was a point where um, a web series became all the rage and, and, yeah. and, you know, people wanted a lot of ancillary material. And we were always super supportive of the behind the scenes stuff. We thought that was great. The making of the, um, those were amazing. And, and I know the fans loved those. Um, but MGM really wanted us to do sort of little fictional spin-off web series. And Brad always used to say, you know, if I have a good idea, it's going in the show. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's making a television show 20, 20 episodes a year. And in fact, when we were doing Atlanta's 40 episodes out of one story room, that's hard. And, um, you know, I just, it's just when you've now, you know, towards the end, come, come to, you know, 360 ish episodes. Um, yeah, you're always looking for something new. And I, I think we talked last time about the fact that, you know, for us, universe ended up moving into such different territory because of that, that the way we felt that, that we needed to try a different approach in order to keep things fresh, you know, not just for, for the audience, but for us as well to explore, mm. explore uh, the Stargate world in a different way. Yeah, new frontiers. Um, yeah, so so yeah, it was it's it's a lot, and um, and I still, as I work through new things, uh, as they you know, in 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 the sort of genre world, I find myself kind of catching myself going, oh no, I've done that before, uh, <laughs> maybe twice, maybe three times. Um, and I guess it's okay to rip off yourself a little, but even, you know, it's like, you, know, you don't get like, caught oh, doing it. Yeah. Or Brad did that episode or Joe and Paul did that episode. And um, I mean, there's this great gag uh, on, um, uh, I think it's South Park about Simpsons did it, right? Have you heard that one? No. Uh, we always used to quote that in, you better fact check me on that, but I'm I'm pretty sure it's South Park where uh, the there the kids are always riffing about you know that the Simpsons have already done everything, which you know again how many episodes are there? What are they on? Two thousand now or something? Yeah, it's season thirty two or so. Well, I mean it makes sense. It's their it's their other long time animated competitor. So yeah, and so and you know we had that as we were going um, where we would notice uh, either we had done things that Trek had done, you know, in our own way through our, our, our characters uh, conceptually, or they would do things that were very similar to episodes we had done. And, you know, uh, it, there are only so many sci-fi concepts, <laughs> you know, and, and so, I think what made them worth doing uh, and made them unique enough to explore was how they were told through the lens of our characters. Um, you know, uh, every show has kind of done a body switching episode. Well, you know, it wasn't Teal'c and O'Neill switching bodies, right? You That's, think? Right. <laughs> But it's like, oh, the time loop show, you know, right. here's the time loop one. Um, and, you know, and even, as I said, I think last time we talked a little bit about time and, and, and doing another time travel story, you know, was certainly not something I had on my list of things to do. But the idea of telling that story uh, using the uh, toys in the sandbox of SGU, um, this was too hard to pass up. That makes a lot of sense. Now, I mean, they, we talked about last time about uh, about in time you you choosing to tell largely the middle story, um, 
with the framing of uh, of the, the or the middle timeline with the framing of the first timeline and infer the third timeline and how you trusted the audience, they'll figure it out. We've given them enough information, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I remember watching that and I was like, Ooh, <laughs> and I, and I went to bed thinking, what was I left with? And uh, at some point in the middle of the night, I was like, I get it now. I get, but it makes you think. And what is sci-fi if, if it doesn't like annihilation or some of these others, if it doesn't make you think, you know, arrival, it's the best of that genre. The other thing that we always uh, enjoyed was when we could tackle current relevant issues in a slightly more safe and maybe less controversial way because it was aliens or, you know, some other sci-fi concept that separated it just a little bit from the actual reality. Mm. Um, so it was, it, you know, I think sci-fi, good sci-fi, um, really does that well is, is allows us to explore the, the issues we're going through, um, in a slightly safer way. I've had uh, a number of fans, uh, submit questions for this round, uh, considerably more than the first, I think largely because uh, the, sh the show is growing. And thank you, thank you everyone for tuning in for that. Uh, but a lot of these questions, and we talked a little bit about this before the show, uh, that the fans uh, uh, submitted are pertaining to what you would do next on Stargate. And I would like to clarify from the start um, where you, with you, where your headspace is at and where your headspace has been. Uh, since you since you moved on from the show in uh, SGU season two, um, because we don't want to disappoint people with with the answers, but we want to at least let them know where you're coming from at it. Uh, since you started your journey elsewhere, and frankly, who could blame you for not wanting to expand um, outward into new horizons to try something something completely different for a while, or you know, stretch yourself creatively in different ways? We had done a lot. And, and I felt like it was time for me to start thinking about other ideas. Um, you know, uh, creatively, you're just never gonna look at a show that was as, as successful as Stargate and complain about it, right? You know, I'm not, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna knock that kind of success or longevity, um, but there comes a point where, you know, you wanna, you wanna do different things. And so I felt I had done uh, pretty much the best I could do within that world. And it was time to, to do some other things, to sort of reach out and, and think about new ideas and new worlds and new characters. And I did not feel like when I was leaving the show that I was, there were untold stories. I don't think I would have left if I had had another great you know, story to tell um with those characters in that world and i also felt that you know the the guys i was leaving the show in you know uh in charge uh were amazing and we're gonna mm -hmm. we're gonna do it justice and mm -hmm. and and had an idea and a vision for where it was gonna go i didn't walk away spending a, a great deal of time uh, about uh, on on ending storylines that I felt were or, or pulling together loose threads or, you know, I, I had I was I was pretty happy with with what I had done. And um, I mean, I know fans have questions about uh, sort of cliffhangers and outstanding storylines and boy, do uh, we. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think for the sake of the franchise, if there is another incarnation, I hope I hope it doesn't spend too much energy trying to wrap things up from the previous shows. I hope it sort of brings a fresh new lens to the idea of what potential the Stargate has to tell stories. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, that's, that's, you know, I'm sure that will not go over well with certain fans who want things wrapped up, but, um, but yeah, I just, yeah. I mean, I think there were ideas that we had planted that will still sort of live on spiritually in the new incarnation. Um, but I hope also that it 
it ultimately isn't a total reboot that starts from scratch because I think I think that that would just feel like ultimately feel like repetition. Uh, I hope it's an evolution. You and I talked, I'm not, it may have been last time, it may have been earlier. When you, when you create um, a story, uh, it shouldn't be in service to just fill in past mythology. You have to push the story forward. And yes. I think if we, if we are lucky with, with SG4, whenever it does, you know, if, if it does get off the ground, we will get a new direction for the franchise while at the same time occasionally incorporating, please God, hopefully, past talent with the new talent that will help fill in those gaps so that we can, like I was saying before, infer a lot of what came before while still moving on. The goal is to bring a new audience and that doesn't always satisfy the old audience. They're like, hey, what about us? And right. you know, we're the loyal fans. There's an entire new audience out there that that doesn't want to feel like they they are not in on the joke, <laughs> you know. So yeah, it is a it is a trick. When a new season um, would begin, when you would when you would approach a new year, how would you approach it from a story and a character arc perspective? Was the was the approach different from season to season or show to show? Did each of the shows have different needs in this regard? What was your goal? Was your so, goal just to get through to the end of the yeah, year? I mean, one of the things that happened when we moved over to um, sci-fi is that they split the seasons. So they would do 10 in the summer and then 10 a little while later. And so we kind of approached the season that way, almost as two 10 episode discrete little mini seasons. And we built to a cliffhanger. I mean, it, you know, again, like what we would do is at the end of a season, we would often have built to some sort of big cliffhanger. And then the, the top of the next season would be already predetermined because we had to resolve that, that introduction. But then we would sort of look at it and say, okay, so, so once that happens, how are we gonna introduce a new element, a new villain, uh, a new issue to deal with a new ally, and then, then rebuild that art storyline to some sort of climactic cliffhanger for the 10th episode, split season cliffhanger. And we would have some idea of what the back half would be, but we would really focus on that first batch of stories. Um, and, you know, what, what dictated our pattern of episodes was varied. You know, there was, there was obviously season long plot and, and uh, mythology arc, um, but there was also things like, uh, you know, we would make sure that each lead character had a balanced number of episodes devoted to them. So there would be a Carter episode or a Daniel episode, or, you know, obviously O'Neill had significant roles in each, but also ones that were necessary were maybe more about him. Mm. Um, and so we would make sure that that was balanced. And then we would look at the kinds of sort of high concept sci-fi concepts that were staggered throughout the season. Um, we would try and make sure there was a mix of what felt like one-off episodic stories that had a real closed-ended nature to them, and then ones that served the ongoing mythology. Um, so yeah, that was it was that sort of trick. There would be a lot of general conversations. And then, you know, from there, we would also have, you know, the the ways in which people would come to stories, right? So mm. Brad, for example would often come in and be like, I have this image. And he, he would, you know, have a, a either a, a setting like a world or a, an image for, for a scene that he wanted to do. And he would build the episode around that. So he would be like, I want to do a show with Sam trapped in a submarine, you know, underwater. And, and the whole episode would then sort of get, built out of that. Or in, in my case, I would often start with um, a notion of 
theme that I wanted to explore um, and, and be like, I want to do a story all about revenge and what revenge means and, and whether it ultimately satisfies its, you know, intrinsic and extrinsic goals. And, and so I would sort of say, how can I, what can I do uh, to put our characters in that position to explore those ideas? And then we would just sort of go from there. And a lot of times it was, yeah, how do we, how do we service the, the past and at the same time bring new ideas in, um, you know, the, the, the introduction of the replicators as a new, uh, as a new force in, and so now it wasn't like, okay, not every episode can be about the replicators from here on in. we still need to tell Gould stories, but, but how are we going to balance those out? And, you know, and a lot of times, uh, we also, to be honest, uh, it would be uh, practical, you know, it would be about sets, you know, we, we would say, okay, we're going to build uh, this set. Um, and, and then this is how we're going to then repurpose it and use it for another episode, a little ways down the line. And uh, we would ultimately say, okay, how do we tell a story <laughs> in this repurposed set? Uh, what can we do with it? Um, so a lot, a lot of times episodes would, would grow out of, out of, you know, almost the, the tail wagging the dog. <laughs> well, I mean, you have the resources that you've built for that season. You know, uh, one of the, my first year on set was in year nine of SG1 and you guys were all excited. You got to come down and see the village. You got to check out the cave. And we were going to these places like, wow, holy cow, these are huge spaces. But the variety, especially with that village, man, the variety of things that you could do with it at that point. Um, and I mean, like the um, the Sodan village uh, uh, was was Chayasar's village in, in, in Atlantis. And it's even I, you know, have to pay close attention and say, oh, that is the same thing. But if you're just looking back at it through all the action and everything else, your your um, your art directors, your set decorators, everyone who was involved Special in the effects. construction. I mean, how yeah. about the one where I don't remember the episode is what it's even called, but you know, I know Joe uh, came in and was like, well, we could do one where, where we just put a bunch of mist in and no one's even going to really see. Whispers. Whispers, yeah. No one's even going to really see. It's brilliant and it's scary. Yeah, very scary. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of times it, it's about uh, the, the, the intersection of uh, art and commerce, as I like mm -hmm. to say. I want to throw a curveball at you here because it's always something that I've wanted to know. And it just flicked, of course, back through my head just now. Um, we, you were talking about how uh, Brad, for example, would, would uh, sometimes build an episode around a scene that he had. And you would approach it from a theme. We with SG one, we really had the advantage of seeing uh, pretty much all of the principal characters' um, uh, backstories and families, but we never met O'Neill's family other than his ex-wife. Um, was that something? I, I don't imagine it was something you you deliberately uh, stayed away from, never meeting his mom or his dad or finding out who those people were. We get one reference in in season seven that that uh, so a friend of his thought that he never had siblings. Um, but it, was it just that that those kinds of stories for your principal actor just never came up? Or was it something that Rick wasn't really interested in exploring? Um, what, what was the answer there? Or did, did just the right story never come along? Honestly, I don't even know. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Uh, yeah. it, it, it was, it just always felt like O'Neill, you know, his his character was more about his like I I've often said that that I feel like character is actually defined by action and and not backstory. It's not about where you went to school or mm. you know uh, who your friends were in university or whatever it is you did. So I think I think his character was really about who he was going forward. And I mean, the one, I guess the one piece of, of backstory that really carried forward was, you know, his relationship with Daniel from the movie. Um, but again, yeah, that was not his, 
his sort of ancient history. Mm -hmm. um, we never talked about it. it's funny. We never we never really discussed. It wasn't like a it wasn't like a real edict from Rick or anything like that. So it wasn't like he said no, I don't want to do that. We just never went there. It's 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 interesting because I mean you've got arguably the. Of course, fans will debate this until the cows come home. Arguably, the most interesting character is is him, and uh, we do uh, go into uh, in season two East Germany with him on a mission, and it's very clear that he is a child and a soldier of the Cold War era. Uh, so his, particularly his issue with Russians, is very consistent throughout the show. It makes it makes a tremendous amount of sense when you look at it from from that perspective. But in terms of like his mom and dad, in terms of it, like like Sam was heavily influenced by by Jacob. What happened to Ronak uh, was uh, completely changed uh, Teal's direction as a human being, and largely you know the loss of Daniel's parents as well changed his story as well. I think it would have been fascinating to 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 see. Uh, the man or the woman or both who who uh and the personalities behind uh the creation of of jack o'neill but you know what like you said if the story doesn't come up it doesn't come up i also think that i'm just making this up as as we're talking but i also feel like in some respects if i was to try and jump into um richard anderson's head o'neill was already kind of fully formed do you know what I mean? Like his past, exploring his past was not going to change who he was now. So what's the point? And and whereas with Daniel and Carter and, and Teal'c, you could see their characters then change as a result of their them interacting with potentially issues that they had had or and that they were still, even though they were obviously accomplished and grown adults, they were still, still wrestling forming yeah. right as in terms of who they were whereas i don't see i don't think we would have been able to convince rick that he needed to change <laughs> uh and i mean he's he's largely playing himself when he's on that set you know and it's it's we we are uh we we get the benefit of his uh, scatterbrain kind of mentality of throwing out, you know, I'm Starsky, this is Hutch. Hey, Tom Macbeth, how are you going to handle that one? Huh? <laughs> I'm going to say it. You know, he was uh, brilliant. And we, yeah, we all I got mean, the benefit the of it. Treat, I think the treat with O'Neill was that he was so superficially sort of um, sarcastic and guarded and, uh, you know, not not emotional, really. Uh, and when it what what was satisfying was when we could put him in a situation that brought that emotion out, and that you could see his how much he cared, particularly about the other members of the team, mm -hmm. um, or you know, or or uh, people that you know he was trying to to save. Um, so. That was that was the sort of the the trick with O'Neill was to not overuse that by any means, um, but rather you know put him in occasionally put him in situations that drew out that side of him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Tom Macbeth often uh, the, uh, talked about it when when we spoke with him. You know, Rick he would. Uh, uh, he, he could give you a, a, a perfectly effective, you know, performance, you know, get the job done, but, and, you know, per, create a, create a fascinating story to boot. And then occasionally you would give him scenes, which would, uh, according to Tom's view, put him, uh, put him in a place that he wasn't necessarily comfortable. And then he will be like, oh, okay, I'll do it. And then this, these acting chops would just like, lash out like the stuff that was beneath the surface beneath the defensive beneath the standoffish uh, o'neill and then you know you get a scene like in window of opportunity i lost my son and i could never live that over again and you just get goosebumps watching that scene take right place. i mean that 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 is really i mean that is the backstory that informs you know o'neill right and and i feel like that was the baggage he always carried around with him um so and that was, you know, I think a thing that we didn't 
explore often, but was certainly mm. there. Um, so yeah, I mean, there you go. That's, that was the, that was the sort of big one. Yeah, exactly. And he makes it clear in Children of the Gods to Daniel, I'll never forgive myself, but sometimes I can forget. Alex asks, uh, we all know Stargate was secretly a comedy, but 200 was also a great opportunity to emphasize the importance of science fiction in general. Whose idea was it to insert uh, Isaac Asimov's quote as the final line in this episode? Uh, again, I wish I could tell you, I'm not hundred okay. percent sure, but I would, if I was guessing, if I had to, if you wanted to bet me right now, I would bet it was Brad. Okay. Um, could have been Paul, but what do you think that uh, says about about the show? Um, because you are you guys are telling, uh, trying to tell a, 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 an entertaining story, um, a good story, you know that that will leave that, that will leave people, you know, not just entertained but hopefully make encourage them to be better. Um, science fiction really is that vehicle to tell uh, existential. Uh, ideas and really uh, paint humanity with a with a broader brush than than you can in a doctors and lawyers show or a cop show or something like that i i don't think anybody in the room ever had the idea of trying to encourage people to be better in their heads when we were coming up with stories or or uh i mean you know i think there was always a sense of you know, portraying right and wrong and a, and, mm. and a, and a morality and a, and a, you know, sense of, of uh, characters having lines that they won't cross or things that they're passionate about. But I don't, I think it was more, this is, these are characters we can respect. And, and, um, and look, we, we just by our nature of who we were as people walked the line and probably crossed over it of trying to to entertain and and tell jokes and and be funny as well i mean i think that was something that i hope the show did successfully was was um not take itself too seriously that it became like preachy or, mm. uh, or, or interest too, too introspective. I mean, I, I think it, you know, I think humor disarms people in ways that hopefully makes them in, engage and enjoy um, more than uh, more than ideas can, you know, and uh and uh, if, if the idea kind of comes along, <laughs> that's great. Um, but, but yeah, I just, I, I think that, that, you know, hopefully in the show, we struck a balance uh, every once in a while, we would go all out like with, <laughs> with 200. Uh, wormhole extreme. And yeah, exactly. I don't know how you guys got through that, especially with the 200. It's like, that must have been a, a days to shoot, you know, with all those different sets and, and it was spread ideas. Out too. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I mean, because you know, obviously, the puppets was a whole other. <laughs> That's true. And a big bit of a big deal, and then, um, yeah, I mean, it was it was uh, it was kind of like shooting a whole bunch of little shows inside a show. So we would pick up things when we could. Oh, okay. Christopher uh, Judge, he and I talked about it once and he, he says for, for that episode, it was, it was rigorous. Every department was going full speed, but he doesn't recall anyone complaining on that, you know, or no, just, I mean, it was like, this is well, the only reason that we're doing this is because of our success. And so this is kind of, we're kind of lighting a candle on top of the cake uh, of, and presenting it to the fans. Here's 200 as a thank you. Well, it also can be, look, the, the show, we did a book uh, like a, a, that celebrated the 200th and we had a big party and, um, and we made hardcover versions of that book and signed them all and gave them to the people who had been with the show from the very start. Um, but even the people who weren't 
on the show from the start. I mean, I, I still meet up with people today who talk about it being the best experience they've ever had. And, and you can forget as you go through the daily grind of, of the hours and, and the hard work making a television show that everybody up and down the line on a crew you know, is doing this because they love the art. They, it's, you know, they're doing it to make money and it, you know, it's definitely an important factor, but they love what they do and they, and they are looking for opportunities to express themselves. Mm. And uh, so when you, when you do give people these um, sort of do what you can, you know, go all out, have fun, scenarios uh they absolutely eat it up and love it so yeah i mean in a way the show was a love letter to the fans but it was also a chance for the for the, the cast and crew to have a great time i want to talk about heroes um next month we are sitting down with saul rubinick and uh i am ecstatic that character his his presence uh, extends, reverberates well throughout those, uh, beyond those two episodes. His, his speeches um, are sensational. And it was, I think, just a, a, a tremendous coup to, to get him for that role. Um, tell us about, and, and, I mean, and, and Michael and, and Terrell and Amanda and Rick, I mean, the, the Don, everyone is on their game in that episode, which I think started off as one hour and became two. Tell us, tell us uh, how the story uh, for Heroes came about and evolved, please. That uh, episode uh, was a very, a very strange uh, journey and a winding road. Um, it started with uh, inspiration. Uh, there was an episode of MASH. I don't, know if you are familiar with it but watched it all of it yeah the um basically a documentary filmmaker comes yeah. to the uh, unit and and uh, uh i always loved that episode um it's a different way of exploring it and and i also thought there was a interesting uh sort of angle to explore about the secrecy of the Stargate program and that here are, you know, people saving the world every week and no one knows. They don't get medals and, you know, accolades and all of the sort of, and they don't ask for it. I don't think they, they're like sitting there going, well, I'm supposed to, you know, I don't, I don't, I should be getting, you know, the best seat in the restaurant or, or, uh, you know, they're going to work back all the time from, yeah. from the public. Like, yeah. Um, but, but to just kind of look at their job, to take a step back and say, wait a minute, um, who are the people and how do they feel about what they do, uh, within this program? Cause it is pretty incredible. Like after you've, you know, we had this thing where, you know, a lot of times um, we'd be doing an episode and the cast would would cease. We, there would be like a shot of them seeing a spaceship or something amazing. And it would be, you know, obviously on a green screen and they'd be standing there and, and we'd be like, okay, now you're seeing the incredible thing. And, and you know, we, we'd cut to their faces and they'd be like, you know, <laughs> and they would so some little bit of awe yeah. and they're like, well, but we've seen this like a million times now, right? Like, what is that? Why is it different or bigger, more special than the thing we've seen before? And I'm like, well, we're kind of hoping the audience feels it's incredible. So it would be nice if you, sh you know, kind of showed that a little too. Right. And, and, I, and, and, you know, so for me, like part of what the approach to heroes was let's, let's really examine how incredible the Stargate program really is and, and, and the people who, you know, we're following. Um, so, so we built that and sort of figured, well, what if this documentary filmmaker, 
you know, was this guy coming in and he was making essentially a, a time capsule piece that he couldn't even release. You know, here he is put in that position of having to um, record this uh, and, and, and not ultimately have it, have it seen. Um, <laughs> so we brought in, uh, uh, we cast Saul, he came in, uh, honestly, he had a lot of ideas about his character. He really took it, uh, he took it on him. It, it was very personal to him. We had a lot of conversations. He did a lot of writing suggestions in the margins of the script. We had a lot of long meetings. Um, and, and there were a lot of things that ultimately got built out on set too, like interview ideas that played out a little longer than they were intended to. And I got in the editing room and, uh, the show was long. I mean, it was quite long. And a typical episode is supposed to come in at um, 42 something, 42 minutes and something seconds. And I think the first cut of this was like 58 minutes. And that was really long. I mean, we normally were, you know, a long episode was 52. And then we, you know, that was just a first cut. And then we sort of whittle it down to 47, 48. Sometimes we would actually be short and have to go shoot new scenes that happened. But this was, this was not just 58. It was a pretty good 58. Like a lot of times you'll watch something and be like, Oh, this is full of air or, you know, just scenes that need to be cut. And I didn't want to cut a lot of it. And I also, you know, from an economic standpoint had learned some very good lessons from from Brad and, and John about taking advantage of things. Like, I mean, I didn't really want to do a clip show that year. Clip shows were ways of, of sort of shortening a, a the schedule of shooting by using footage that we had shot before and hopefully creative and, and you know, interesting ways. One of my favorites is uh, uh, Citizen Joe. Um, but, you know, also because of Dan Castellaneta, but- uh, oh, Yeah, I'm brilliant. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I saw this as an opportunity and then it became a question of logistics, right? How do we actually execute it? Um, and at that point I started spinning ideas about how to fill it out into a two-parter. And, uh, you know, I had to talk to the network about it. I had to sort of look at the schedule and see if there was an episode because this was shot to be in the first half of the season. Oh. And, and then I started, you know, how do we re, re sort of organize the director's schedule? Because I, I knew Andy who had directed the first 58 minutes needed to direct the scenes that would, that would turn it into a two-parter. And I was trying to do something um, that I actually didn't even know whether it would work, which was to, not add time to the end or tell more story because it obviously had a, a, you know, a satisfying ending, um, but insert scenes. So make it longer, but also didn't want to necessarily do more of the same. And I thought if the whole story is about getting to the, to the underlying layers of the Stargate program, the secrecy and, and, and the challenge for for Saul's character was to essentially penetrate that layer of secrecy and his frustration at not being able to really tell the full story, even though it wasn't going to be seen by the world. Um, you know, the military sort of layers uh, and how he's trying to tell this story about the sacrifices and and what heroes, what real heroes are are doing out on the front lines. Um, so I invented this other secret investigation that was going on at the same time. And, oh. and those scenes were written and then the scenes about that investigation were then sort of added. Um, uh, and we were really <laughs> super lucky to, to then get 
um, Mr. Picardo to come up and and play that character. Um, and so we actually ended up taking a hiatus, like our summer hiatus of shooting uh, between the half seasons. And we came back to shoot scenes from Heroes, which was then moved to a, a two-parter uh, that, that aired later in the season. So we actually shot something earlier to, to fill that hole in the schedule early in the, in the uh, uh, first half. So it was a weird, I mean, we, we even had a situation where uh, I got a call to come down to set because um, Rick was uh, in the control room and had gotten a haircut which he normally does when he comes back from hiatus. And it didn't, he just looked totally different than <laughs> he was supposed to in a, in a scene that he was playing like immediately after. So he, was, <laughs> he didn't, so uh, Jack didn't have time to get a haircut even. You couldn't no, pull an appendicitis no. thing. <laughs> no, it was shot literally six to eight weeks later. Um, and his hair was completely different. And it is in the scene, you can see it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I was like, well, I guess somehow O'Neill in the interim went and went down to the, uh, salon in <laughs> Iron Man and, uh, what are you going to do? Yeah. Put a wig on him. Come on. <laughs> so, so yeah, that, I mean, Andy did a brilliant job with that episode. He deserves all the credit in the world for, for managing that. And, um, I'll be, I'll really be interested to hear what, um, what Saul has to say about it uh you know to be in full to you know full disclosure he and i had uh some very healthy uh creative discussions uh that i think ultimately led to uh a much better final product i completely appreciate the 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 challenge that that was there was particularly one speech which i know the fans have sort of um pointed out, um, you know, is, is, is phenomenal. Uh, the one in the hallway. Yeah. He oh, was, gosh, he was, uh, he was particularly frustrated at me, uh, during that speech and, and, uh, just prior to it. And I remember him very clearly after giving that speech, kind of looking at me like, huh, huh? You know, and the creative process is um, occasionally not perfect. And, um, you know, I guess when it, you know, when all is said and done uh, and you look back on it, you're like, well, that couldn't have happened really any other way. Um, so I don't have any uh, regrets at all. When, when you're over the target, I mean... You just are, and everyone kind of feels it. There's there's a reason that that cast uh, continually brings up that episode uh, when we talk with them, that they um, they saw the product on the page, they knew what they were filming was good when when they did it, and they they trusted you guys, they trusted Andy, they trusted the editors to pull it off, and it's um, a point. I actually had, a, I had an actor on. Um not one of our leads, but, but one of the guest stars uh, came up to me during filming at one point and said, and I think he 100% he meant this respectfully. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I don't think realized just what he was saying exactly, but uh, he said, I didn't know Stargate did this. And I was like, did what? <laughs> And he didn't really had an he didn't really have an answer, but I, I mean, look, I, the way I took it was, you know, like drama, like serious drama. And I was like, I could point to dozens of episodes that, you know, explored these themes. But for whatever reason, uh, or 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 had you know wonderfully dramatic, serious moments. I mean, even you even uh, quoted a good one in Window of Opportunity, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a stigma reason. about sci-fi. It's pew pew and you know this and that and yeah, and I think uh it struck a chord and mm -hmm. also the 
I guess what I had hoped for was that there's a introspective uh, honesty that you can't escape when you're looking directly into the camera. It changes everything. Um, you know, I've always been fascinated with, and I love documentary because of the effect that cam the camera's presence has on the way people behave, um, but also the whether or not it's actually a true reflection of who you are in reality. Like, what are you, you know, how are you behaving differently? Like, I, I just, I, I find that whole phenomenon fascinating. So it was, it was a lot of fun to explore. And I do think it got our characters to uh, explore things that they hadn't previously. You gave that speech to Hammond. You know, the cameras change um, things simply by being there. And you can see it really in the performances with the people on screen, particularly with Amanda and Michael. They, they really, I don't know how much they were loving it. They may have been, you know, like, oh. But um, it, it was really kind of like a Truman Show kind of moment where we're kind of watching them really playing those characters like they're on camera and being aware that they're on camera for the very first time, you know, and that they've been trained to keep this a secret, to talk about it, to not be able to talk about it in public. If anyone kind of brings it up, you know, like Jack goes, what, what are you talking about? Starting over, I don't know, in um, secrets. And now they're being confronted with someone who is on the outside, looking in at them, pointing a camera in their face, shining bright lights in their face, say hello to the world. I mean, how can Carter do anything but go, hi. You know, yeah. they're just going to work. Yeah. They know that what they're doing is important. And then this guy comes in for, for good or for ill and says, what's it like? Was Saul based, was Emmett based on any uh, uh, documentary filmmaker in particular? Not really, no. I mean, like I said, I, 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 I was, heavily inspired by that MASH mm -hmm. episode. And, and it, there are a lot of similarities in terms of the reactions of the people, you know, the characters in, you know, being interviewed in the show where it's like, look, this is a miserable thing we're being forced to do in that case. And, you know, we don't see ourselves as heroes. We're, we're kind of prisoners. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We had a lot of funny episodes in MASH, but uh, you know, but that, the, the shenanigans would go out the door when they would have to go into that operating theater. Well, yeah, um, but the shenanigans were a coping mechanism. You yeah. know, it was it was entirely a just a steam valve release of tension from what is a unimaginably horrible experience. Janet and Emmett, uh, I didn't expect as I was first watching uh, the, the chemistry um, there, was that written that way? Or am I just reading what I want to out of yeah, those I, two I, in no, that I scene? Think, I think that they played stuff. They, like, great actors find things, you know, like that they they want. And, and, and even though Janet was a beloved character who many fans uh, hated me for killing, um, you still in the episode want to connect to her, right? You want to remind people that how important she is or how, so even just seeing another little side of her on camera made you care even more. Not that you needed to, like fans loved her already, but like the, from, from a dramatic perspective contained within that episode, you wanted people to know who she was. So that even if this that was the only episode of Stargate you'd ever seen, you'd be like, "Oh, okay, I'm I'm sad that she's gone." Um, yeah, I mean, look, uh, any time we talked about killing a character, it was obviously a big deal in the room, and we, you know, in that case, we didn't do it lightly. But at the same time, people died and came back to life, or or we thought they were dead, but then they weren't for some reason. Um, that, again, to me, it was like, you have to occasionally lose someone in order for there to be any real jeopardy, in order to feel like there's actual stakes in the show. And yeah, we're at war. felt like 
the one where you actually, if we had just lost a red shirt, uh, I don't think it would have been the same. Tell us, uh, it's also important to remember, there was no season eight planned at this point. You guys were going to go and tell, you know, movies or, you know, or at least with the SG-1 cast and, you know, launch Atlantis. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, to be on, I mean, I guess to be perfectly honest, um, by the time all of that had been, that fate had been sealed, I think we were already moving towards, like, Lost City, um, we knew we were going to be doing Atlantis. Like Atlantis was in in prep, and and SG One was going to continue uh, by that time. So I don't remember the sequence of events of of Atlantis being picked up versus the decision to kill Janet. But mm. um, but yeah, I mean it. Uh, at that point, we were sort of full steam ahead on the two shows. What was it like sharing that news with Terrell? She's told us her perspective on, on the television. You, you gave her a, you gave her a phone call and. Oh, I don't think she's happy about it. Uh, it was a gig. It was a good gig for her. And she loved the character. Um, no, no, no actor likes to be told their character is dying. But I, again, I think, I think she understood uh, why, and it didn't have anything to do with her. She's a, a lovely person and you know sometimes you kill characters because you don't like the actor but that, <laughs> that wasn't not on our case. show no <laughs> no you just wouldn't never. bring him back you know? never <laughs> um and who could blame you you know you, no, get to, I mean, you have I've to work had, with them I've had actors come to me and say i don't want to do this anymore and yeah. and 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 so you figure out a way to get them out of it but uh but um yeah i mean she was uh uh a great sport about it. How early was uh, Janet's death considered for the plot? Was it pretty early on when you were when you were tooling with heroes, where it was like, yeah. if we're gonna yeah. do this, we we have to go full bore. We have to we have to go all in and, yeah. and you know and eat everything that we're putting out on that table. These are heroes. Yeah. They give the greatest sacrifice. Yeah, exactly. That was. I mean, it didn't. To me, the story didn't work if we hadn't killed somebody we cared about. So it achieved everything you set out to to create with it. Short of killing one of the leads. <laughs> <laughs> I think fans would argue Janet was one of the leads, but I mean at the- at Yeah, the, I know, at, I have no disrespect to Janet. Sure. No, she this- was, she, was, she was not one to four on the call sheet. <laughs> that's true, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, no, I, I um, uh, my dad is uh, ex uh, was was a re is a retired army major. My grandfather um, served as well, and uh, watching that episode brought tears to our eyes because we we get it. You know, I mean, for me, I'm losing Janet, um, but at the same time, you know, watching it with him, he gets what it's like to be on the front line. He he had a he took a, I mean, he got a, he got injured. He took a purple heart. He got a purple heart. So it's just, it was powerful stuff and you achieved it well. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, look, we on some level understood that we were doing it, you know, we're making entertainment, but we're also, you know, showing soldiers going off to war and in many cases fighting aliens, but nevertheless, there were lives being sacrificed and we didn't want it to always feel um, you know, like a, like a first person shooter video game, it, it, you know, and, and we had those issues, frankly, with the, the, the Jaffa as well, you know, like I, we talked about this last time where the, the replicators reason for, for, you know, creating the replicators is because it was hard to <laughs> mow down rows of essentially people who were being subjugated. So yeah, slaves, mm -hmm. I want to switch gears. How early on did you know you wanted to direct uh, Stargate? In I've Stargate. talked about this in, a, in one of the DVD extras too. I mean, look, I, I've wanted to direct since I was a kid. I mean, uh, I got into the business wanting to be a director. I think writing was kind of a, uh, a strategy for, <laughs> uh, 
eventually putting myself in the director's chair. Um, it didn't quite have the uh, impact I was hoping um, initially. What do you mean? Well, I mean, I just thought I would write some scripts and then I would get to direct them. Um, which <laughs> <laughs> didn't plan on taking nine years to, uh, in yeah. one show. Yeah. Well, even, you know, and in in years before that, before I even got on Stargate. So um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then it just became about, look, I also really uh, developed a respect for how hard it was. The forces at work against a director on t in television are, are incredible. And, um, you know, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, a learned skill and a, a talent. Um, and it is not something that I ever took lightly. I had a tremendous amount of respect for the directors who were on the show. Uh, and I didn't want to fuck it up. You know, I didn't want to uh, be the guy who, you know, sort of put himself in that chair and then somehow, you know, screwed it up and, and looked like I was undeserving of being there. Um, it ended up turning into a really great experience because, um, maybe not right at first, but because, you know, the, the crew and the cast really didn't know us as writers um, as well as they should have or, and vice versa. I mean, we, we felt like we knew the characters, but, you know, from, a, from an execution point of view, the crew, you know, always looked at us as being, you know, they, they used to call it carpet country, you know, the offices where we, yeah. where we, you know, the, the writers hung, hung out. It was above um, Stargate Command and, yeah. and Atlantis. It was all in that same yeah. building. You would go across the corridor yeah. and upstairs, you guys are all up on another floor, like in the sky. <laughs> and I remember the first time I directed, uh, a number of the crew uh, sort of said to me at different points, was like, I didn't, you're not what I thought you were. You know, and I was like, well, really, what did you think I was? And they're like, well, you're just like a normal guy. And <laughs> like, I don't know what they, you know, what impression they had of me or how I was projecting myself uh, before that. There's something about being in the trenches, you know, with, with the crew uh, and, and, you know, it shows A, your sort of passion and sacrifice you're willing to put in the hours, but also that you kind of know uh, how the, the sausage is made, you know, like you understand exactly. all of that. So that was a great, experience too and and uh so i i mean the first episode i did was crusade which which sort of um clip show like we talked about it was a clip show yeah <laughs> um but uh you know i actually i remember had i had one day was a sort of uh, the the interrogation of of um, vala claudia black and um i had I had sort of super prepped for that because I was concerned about multiple eye lines. Uh, I had met characters on different sort of hinge. She was the hinge point of the scene. And so I had done this diagram of all the camera angles that I wanted to do <laughs> in order to cover it. And this diagram was like, it looked like a serial killer had, had you know, <laughs> created it in his mom's basement. I don't know. I don't know what it was. It was crazy. And um, but I ended up, I like, I don't know how, how much, uh, people know about the sort of technical lingo, but every time you do a, um, every time a camera is set up to do a shot, it's called a setup. And, and so there's usually your day is designed because of how long lighting takes, you know, you have so many setups you can do in a day in order to get through it. And that that's part of the challenge of being a director is you, you have an economy of time and an economy of shots you can do. And the more complicated the shot, um, you know, the, the less, the more time it takes and the less time you have uh, for the other shots you might want to do. There's literally only so much you can do in a day. And there's only so many days you get for the episode because of budget. Um, you know, we would have, it was a, I didn't make it up. There's a famous saying about there's, you know, there's directors who will shoot a feature in the morning and, and TV in the afternoon because you know, they spent all day doing this one elaborate crane or tracking shot that took the entire morning. 
and then they've got to make up all the coverage that they need to get the, the rest of the scenes they have set for that day. But in this particular scene, I think because we were shooting three cameras, which I guess is a bit of a cheat in terms of how you're counting. So we would have three cameras rolling at any given time. I did some record number of setups for uh, for the show. And, <laughs> In your first episode. Yeah, I mean, like we a good day, a good day for like on a big action day where there are a lot of um, pieces in play, you might do 20 to 30 setups, you know, sometimes even less. Um, you know, on a heavy sort of studio day, you could really roll and get a lot of setups. You might do, you know, 50 would be a, a really good day. I think I did 90, 90 plus setups that day. And I remember our script supervisor came over to me and says, you know, I, you know, this is, I think this is a record. Uh, wow. <laughs> and you didn't uh, intend anyway. to do that. It was just how you had approached it, right? Yeah. And I actually ended up breaking that record <laughs> on, on time. Uh, really? Some years later with, with uh, Jim Menard. Yeah, we were in the studio, also three cameras rolling, and I did some like more than a hundred setups, I think. And, uh, and it's funny because I think I did the most setups and the fewest setups on another day. Because <laughs> <laughs> we were doing the, the stuff with the, um, the helmet cam mm -hmm. in the forest and it was all, you couldn't shoot two cameras. It was all from one camera's point of view, which was like the bane of my existence for that, that episode was, was trying to set up these little multi uh character plays you know you were essentially had one point of view you could shoot from and uh i don't remember how i did like eight or nine setups one day and it was like that's the fewest we've ever done so i i i i, I set up the goalposts and <laughs> there you go set up i i want to come back to crusade uh the uh with, with time i always wanted to know how much of that was because David was actually, wasn't David wearing uh, yeah, he was the wearing camera some of the time? Wanted to, well, I've, I, I've, I'll send you some pictures okay. of, um, of the setup you can insert into this. Okay. Uh, he, he really wanted to be the camera. Um, but camera technology has actually come so far, even since we mm -hmm. got that episode. We still couldn't just stick up a phone on a helmet and have him walk around. You, you know, we had um, standards by which we had to deliver. You know, you could degrade something to look like it was bad, but it had to start at a certain level. Yeah, you have to start standard. with the high quality. Yeah. So, yeah, so we had a level of camera, and those cameras weren't um, that portable. I mean, they, they, so in this case, Jim, who's incredibly, Jim Menard was the DP on that, incredibly inventive guy. I mean, we had to figure out ways. <laughs> There's a shot where, uh, uh, Rush throws the Kino through the gate and it, and it rolls on the other side. So we have to figure out how to get that shot. And Jim, <laughs> eight ways to Sunday, the effects guys came up with concepts and we could not figure out. And it had something to do with the axis of the way, you know, even when something's rolling, it looks like it's rolling the other way. Ah. It's a physics thing. It's crazy. But they wrapped a Genesis, which is at the time was the state of the art camera. It's big, it weighs, it's, you can almost barely lift it. And they wrapped it in ferny pads, these big blankets and taped it and rolled the camera down the ramp. <laughs> That's a, was it, I think $150,000 camera. <laughs> and they it's, it's insured, it's big. insured. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So David had a, we had a pencil cam that was wired to a pack. Now the problem is we were also shooting in a jungle that had rain. So we had to somehow tether that camera to a very heavy pack. And then that pack had to be waterproof. Yeah, he didn't so want to electrocute your a, He was wearing a giant pack on his back as well as the helmet and the camera. Um, and then the camera, it had to have a, like a, a flag on it to keep the rain off of it. It was, uh, anyway, he, he was unbelievable. 
he was a trooper. Um, but it was important for him because he felt like the camera was a character. It was him. And, and where he would look and how he would talk was how it should re be reflected in the show. So it was important to him that he be the guy. Yeah, you're seeing Eli's point of view in those shots, yeah. you know, right. and you're, you're inferring the character through the movements of that camera. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of like, I mean, it's like HUD in, in Cloverfield, you know, you get HUD's swagger throughout that movie. In this case, you have, you have Eli's boisterous sing-songy personality attached to a, a camera and everyone's kind of like, just, oh, there's Eli, you know, with his camera and Rush just does, does this with it, of course. That There's had a few to shot where, where we had a, a, a stunt cameraman, uh, particularly the one where he had to fall, yeah. uh, um, who, who took the fall for him. What was it like working in the rain for that kind of a situation? You know, oh, at least it's I controlled, mean, it's on set. Yeah, and it was actually very warm. Um, so the water was heated, uh, which is great. Um, and uh, yeah, super, super controlled. It was, it was great. Wow. They, uh, we talked about uh, uh, with with Atlantis, uh, Tori and, and David uh, and Robert Davi in the storm in the eye, working on that set with the wind blowing. They said so many people got sick after that, and everyone was like sent like a bottle of I forget what it was. It's like for a job well done. It was just intense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to go back to D to Dominion. You had Michael Ironside uh, in that episode. Crusade, not Dominion. Why do I keep saying that? I put Dominion in the notes and I yeah, said, yes. It's called Crusade. Thank it's you, okay. Robert. I, I appreciate can, it. I, you're, you know what? The only reason I remember it is because I directed it. <laughs> Very good. I wanted to know, uh, in what sort of ways did you put yourself to school for that? Did you sit Did you sit behind like Martin Wood and Andy Makita for a number of weeks here and there and get their input? How, how did How did you approach that personally in your directing journey? You know, what, um, what, what did you put yourself, what kind of paces did you put yourself through so that when you came down on that set, you were a director? You were not executive producer, writer, Robert C. Cooper. You were the director for Crusade. Part of my education was actually editing 100 or 150 episodes uh, prior to that you know like when you sit in the editing room with other directors footage you very quickly figure out what they are doing right and what they're doing wrong i think for me um the learning curve was not what shots to get, but how to elicit the best performances and how to interact with both the crew and the, and the actors to get the most out of people. Um, and, 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 you know, every actor is different. Every actor it's takes fair. direction differently. They all, you know, respond differently to both praise and criticism. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, like if I do another take, is it going to get better? Um, do I have time to do another take? Like all of those decisions are, are things that you learn much more from experience. Um, and uh, yeah, there was, I would say there was a learning curve there. I'm not even sure. I, I, I wouldn't even sure I, I, I got there on that episode. I mean, it was took me multiple episodes before I felt comfortable um, and even having any sort of style uh, of, of approach that, you know, at the end of the day became my own. You know, I, I, would, I would say, this is how I'm gonna approach a scene or block a scene or give someone feedback on their performance. There were definitely, uh, Andy and, and Martin, uh, Will, who was, uh, you know, a camera operator for us for a long time before he became one of our best directors, um, who, who I, you know, would, would sort of run stuff by. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the challenge, the challenge were the things that, you know, how do you, how do you adapt to the unpredictable because and you can't plan for that like you can have you can have a, the best plan in the world mm -hmm. and then you have a camera go down or your crane doesn't work and 
now all of a sudden you need to shoot the scene a different way than what you planned you know or you 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 don't have the time you thought you did mm -hmm. an actor shows up and doesn't know their lines i mean what are you going to do how are you going to right so it's it's the adaptability that you know you have to learn how to adjust to those challenges that's the the real trick and that and again that just comes from experience now what the advantage I had was I knew I wasn't going to fire myself. So, <laughs> so I, I kind of had the, and I mean, it's part of the reason I waited as long as I did was because I felt like I had, I had gained enough respect, um, both from the other writers and the cast and the crew and the studio that, you know, I was, I was, I was not really going to, fail miserably it would it would it would we would get something out of it it's going to be serviceable <laughs> it may be excellent but it'll definitely be serviceable it might take a little more time or whatever <laughs> and, and and i mean look one thing that i i did learn from producing as much as i had is that aside from the things i've mentioned you know part of good directing is putting all those elements in the, in place and not to take too much credit as the producer but Good directing is also good producing. So do I have the sets? Do I have the great location? Have I cast the right actors? Like, you know, he said, well, Michael Ironside. So it was like, hmm. I've put the elements in place that help me succeed as a director. So, you know, and, 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 you know, when you look at my resume of the episodes I directed, it's no coincidence that some of the more spectacular uh things we've done on the show i would be like oh maybe i'll direct that one because i because you know you know uh that it's it's gonna look great you know it's hard to go to vegas and not have the show look different and great i mean i guess i could have screwed that up but it's harder <laughs> to right. screw that up you know it's harder to go to new mexico in a bunch of hoodoos and and not have it look spectacular you know like so by by being a good producer you can certainly be a better director um by giving yourself the tools that you uh you know like they did you know other directors like oh i noticed you got a 50 foot crane for this episode interesting you know you never want to seem to give me the 50 foot crane uh <laughs> Well, I mean, it would be a it would be a, a something that I'm sure people would think about. Well, the executive producer is coming down. You know, he's of course going to make his shows look spectacular, and we get whatever's left. You right. know, I mean, it's at a certain point, it's like you know, you're here to do a job. You have the tools that you're here to do, and you also the, the one of the things that I loved about all the different episodes that that you directed, and I would eventually like to get to all of them uh, in, in future episodes, is that they're all so wonderfully different. You know, it, it really looked like you were you were taking yourself into a Baskin and Robbins and each episode was a different flavor of ice cream. Yeah, I mean, that was, in, you know, I, I would design them that way. I would be like, this is an this is a and, and that was partly like, you know, Brad used to always say, science fiction is not one genre it's all of them and that's right so you know it gave us this ability to do all those different things and i i basically did that i wanted to explore all the different flavors and opportunities and i didn't ever want to feel like i was repeating myself as a director i didn't ever want to feel like i was in the same exact place doing the same exact thing so i always tried to make sure there were unique elements to to the stories that I was directing. Absolutely. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, was the Ori storyline completed to your satisfaction? A little bit of a left turn here. Sorry, we're going on a few different uh, roads. No, that's fine. I, I mean, yes, I, I, I got the opportunity to kind of make a much, again, there's a, another example of, of sort of getting to give myself bigger and better toys. Um, I got to do a, 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 you know, a movie version of the ending. Um, so, 
so yeah, I mean, that was my shot, whether, whether it, you know, audiences were ultimately satisfied. Um, we, we did kind of close that, close that loop off. How early on, um, were you considering adding an additional element to Arc of Truth? In this case, it's the replicators. Um, kind of unexpected that we would get a visit from an old enemy. Was it that you needed to, What was there not enough in the Ori elements or did you want to just take it in a, a different direction for, a, for a, a chunk of the film? The film was ultimately not just a um, a wrap up of the Ori story. It was it was it was a kind of a, a conclusion to SG One seasons mm -hmm. nine and ten, and and you know it was supposed to be you know in the same way that it was a closure. It was also maybe a, a little bit of some of the the sort of greatest hits of those <laughs> seasons, and and um, and I never and I felt like we had not resolved. The replicators either and and there was an interesting evolution to play with them um i just thought well if there was going to be another complication um wouldn't it be kind of cool if it was that it was certainly unexpected and who knew the asgard core could turn out our greatest enemy or one of our greatest enemies it was also a chance to play with a bigger budget um that's true too you know, with those, with those uh, VFX elements. And Joel Goldsmith got to revisit a, a lot of uh, uh, his older themes in that episode as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, uh, I can't even, I can't even really say enough about, about Joel and, and he's, you know, just dearly, dearly missed. Dearly missed. Sad, sad that he's not with us anymore. But, but he uh, left us in, incredible art, you know, that's one of the things that I've been fighting for is if, if I can take it aside for a moment is uh, uh, trying to get uh, his, his uh, music released in some way, but that's, it's such a complicated deal, you know, his estates involved and everything else. I haven't really a attempted, you know, to, to push that forward in, in a few years now, but there's so much good stuff there. And there's all these albums that are being released from all these classic sci-fi shows. It's like, Joel's needs to be out there, at least at least highlights or selections or something, you know. Because there was some stuff that that, that was available. I, I didn't. There are. It. Well, I mean, you've got the art. He's got uh, uh, the pilots, the the children of the gods um, uh, re-release has uh, has been out, and that's like the most recent thing. But like individual, uh, other than season one of SG One, his his music from those individual seasons. Aren't out there. Yeah, I mean, and I, then I Arc of Truth and Continuum. Best, some of the best work he ever did was on uh, SGU. I agree. Yeah, especially that closing piece, for sure. Jen Kirby wanted to know: Have the fans ever inspired you to write anything specific? Certainly, episodes like Two Hundred um, are at least partially love letters uh, to the fans. But was there ever something perhaps less overt that snuck its way in? I don't, I'm sure there was, and I, I mean, no disrespect to the fans. I mean, we uh, certainly paid a lot of attention. I mean, the, it's, people probably know this one. It's it, the most sort of talked about um, case where there was a lot of uproar when Scar died at the end of season one. And uh, I remember the, panicked sort of phone call from the studio and the conversations that ensued about how do we bring him back. <laughs> um, that was that was a, a fairly big one. So he was so Alexis wasn't intended for to appear in season two then? No. Okay. Yeah, I I remembered that there was a one there's one comment that's out there, Brad, on one of the DVDs where they like insert him into a shot uh with with peter williams when they're getting ringed away um and that was it was all done in post uh where scara when you know chlorel and and apophis escape and, yeah. and i knew that that wasn't originally planned that way but i i didn't know that he wasn't supposed to make it out of the end of season one either no wow 
well, for lucky for us, he did. Yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, I, I wanted to ask about Ronnie Cox, one of one of the bigger dangling ones for me. And Sam asked this as well. Uh, Ronnie Cox's Kenzie was amazing. Awesome. Yeah. Was there ever a plan to re- oh, unbelievable. revisit him? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He kind of just sails <laughs> off in a mothership. You no, know, a- I'm talking about I'm talking about the the, uh, the senator character. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, absolutely. You never uh, see that. Never see that happening in reality, right? No. Yeah, and Ronnie Cox called him he, a combination of Orrin Hatch and a uh, and uh, what's his face from Doctor Strangelove. Okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> did, did was there I ever? Mean, Ronnie's a great guy, and and you know, loved the character. It was mm-hmm. he was a ton of fun. Honestly, I don't remember a ton of um, a ton of conversation about reprising him after that. How do you keep your head on straight? You know, I I, I can't imagine how you guys handled handled um, uh, forty episodes a year. And I think one of the re- in talking with you the last hour, I was thinking in the back of my mind. I think that there's a reason that most shows are ten to thirteen episodes, and I don't think it's just for budget. You know, I think that that's the number, uh, really, the number of of good to excellent episodes that any one or two or three people can tell in in a year. The rest would be just average or filler. I'm not going to disagree with you, but it's actually, I think, more to do with the balance of episodic sort of plot driven shows versus. Um, serialized storytelling so in a purely serialized storytelling world which a lot of streaming has sort of gone towards Mm -hmm. premium cable went towards um yeah i mean look coming up with a 20 episode serialized story is much harder because you're going to burn through a lot more story you're going to want twists at some point the twist i mean there have been shows network shows that are meant are, are meant to go that length and that are heavily serialized I won't name them, but <laughs> were less successful because they had to. So you'd you'd see that they got you know six episodes in, and it's like they were already out of story, and then they had another sixteen left to go. Um, or the show would just get so twist heavy that you you kind of lost interest because there was nothing to to actually hang on to because every every other episode the show would take a turn in a different direction. So the fact that we could sparse out the mythology shows and the arc with these standalone stories shows like the x-files did that incredibly successfully um allowed you to do a longer run because there were these interspersed and then again you're right sometimes they were less successful uh episodes but for the most part you could sustain a longer season where i I think that if you were doing like i don't think 20 episodes of the sopranos would have been the same um, because what you're watching is is a is a novel, right? You're watching a novel, right? Uh, and 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 twenty chapters is a lot. Um, yeah. So I think that's a factor in 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 what you're you're talking about. And yeah, forty was well, was crazy. You have to look back on those years with pride. You know, you pulled something off that probably a lot of people said this is not going to work. It was possible because of the the machine we had built and the people behind the scenes who were who were incredibly good at their jobs um the production team what do you think is in store for the future not just for 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 yourself but the the future of storytelling you know once we get out of this mess uh smaller cameras more efficient devices we have drones now you don't need cranes anymore per se it's one of the things that martin wood was talking about with us he 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 achieves shots now um that he never thought uh, possible. The the channels for storytelling are opening in in such such an interesting way, and the the tastes of audiences have also changed as well. Much more like ADD. What what? Uh, well, that what do you to think me is going to happen? Problem is you know, and I, I would say this always about technology. Every time we saw a leap forward, and you always need to stop and ask the question just because we can do it doesn't mean we should do it. It's the Jurassic Park question. I don't mean that as a warning sign for AI or anything like that. I'm talking right. about, I'm just talking about dramatically in the show, is this newfangled 
piece of technology or equipment or way of shooting something actually valid to supporting the story or telling the story or revealing character. So, you know, I guess in a way I'm, I'm being the writer and saying it all comes back to the story, but what, what, what you often see now is, um, is the, you know, the spectacle of the technology is incredible, but there's nothing to hang it on. And so you have a bunch of, of, of films and shows that don't really satisfy you. They look pretty and, and, and have inc you know, incredible shots in them, but to what end? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is, I think the problem, frankly, with, with this explosion of television that we've seen of content, I guess we would call it. There's so much is, stuff. So much stuff, but how much of it is really good and worth it? And um, uh, I don't know. I don't know whether we're going to see a contraction. I think there's too much platform out there, uh, too mm -hmm. much demand for content. I think that we haven't fully seen the impact of globalization and not just on the economy of the business, but on the content itself. And I know I enjoy watching things made by people from other places and set in other worlds and, uh, you know, places in our world. Um, so, I mean, I guess I'm looking forward to seeing a lot more of that type of content instead of having it all come out of one place. Mm -hmm. and, in, and in fact, one mentality, which I think is been successful in the past, but also is somewhat flawed. That's a fair point. What uh, in the past year have you seen um, that really wowed you that Ooh. is available now that you can recommend to Ooh, tune in? That's, um, hmm. I don't know if I want to ask you this because the last time you gave me a recommendation, I watched eight seasons of Through the Wormhole. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I'd like uh, to know. Let me see. I mean, my viewing, uh, uh, my viewing habits tend to be very different from the things I work on. That's fair. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I, I think there are things that I, I guess fully recommend are few and far between because I always have thoughts about them as well. You know, and it's like, and that's not to say I don't value them, but I also would be like, Oh, I like this, but right. <laughs> With a caveat. Yeah. I mean, huh, lately, hmm. <laughs> I mean, one of the best, I think one of the best shows on TV is Better Call Saul. Um, yeah. And this last season was particularly good. Um, it felt like a lot of what was happening was building to this season. Um, I think uh, this season of Ozark was particularly good, this last sort of stretch of Ozark. Both succeed in, in, in a, a way uh, that I think is really important, which for me as a viewer, which is that they, they keep the world small, but the stakes really big for those characters within that world. I give probably given my past experience, my past work uh, experience, I'm less inclined to want to watch things where the heroes save the world every week. I just find there's no stakes in that. There's such overload, you know, and you can only yeah, go there and, so many places. Just, I don't, it's just different, frankly, different window dressing on the same thing. And um, so when I see a different take on a character in a slightly different flavored world, but it's like, it's all about, will they get what they want? Will they succeed? you know, what do they care about? Right. That's what I'm drawn to. I mean, to me, the, the shows I've loved over the years have been, um, have been that, you know, the great, to me, the great shows have always not been about saving the world. They've been about the characters, the, the specific characters and, and how those characters resonate for me in a grander sense. Like it, it, you mm -hmm. can apply it to a bigger, concept but it's still just about uh, winning or losing the game they're playing
you know, I've been working on a on a project that that involves um, fighting, and and you know, the key for me in pitching it has been fights can look spectacular, but the real trick to them is caring whether or not the people in them win or lose the fight, and that's what you know how I, I kind of approach what I'm working on, but also what I like watching. I also tend to watch things that are not in the field I'm working on, like, uh, you know, curb your enthusiasm. <laughs> I think it's important to have some variety, you know, yeah. but it's, it's funny, you know, like J Judith Scheinlin always said that she would, she was perfectly happy with going home and, and watching, you know, lawyers programs and everything else. So some people are just like in their groove. It's not, I don't know how you could do it. So it's one of the reasons I never watched The Office was because at the time I was living, I was working in that kind of an environment when that was right. on. It was like, I don't want to go home to that. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Last question for you. Very important. Uh, Genius wants to know, aren't you upset you didn't get an Emmy for Best Supporting Actor in Wormhole Extreme? I mean, what the heck, Rob? Well, first of all, um, you know, there's no category for the part I played. I don't think the role was quite big enough to get a supporting actor nod. Um, so really the, the Academy needs to look at that, I think, before, you know, and before anything. Um, the, yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, I'm, I'm still bitter about it. And, and part of the reason I haven't uh, done any more acting because um, I was robbed. Yeah, if they're not going to respond to you the first time, are you going to stick your neck out there again? I don't blame you. I, I was I, I was just telling this story that um, it's such a vivid memory for me sitting in the director's chairs offset uh, with Willie Garson, um, and he's telling me some story about his apartment and the rent he's paying on it and, and, and all this stuff. And, and I was, you know, yeah, it's interesting. It's great. It's cool. And he's going on and on. And, and, and sort of out of my periphery, I hear the AD say first team and, and uh, Willie gets up out of his chair and we, and I follow him and we're starting to walk on to set and there's all this commotion coming around and people are doing, you know, finals and stuff on us. And then Peter Deloy, I hear Peter Deloy's yell, action. And, and Willie goes from telling me like mid sentence, he's telling me this story uh, about his apartment and he just turns into the character and goes like this and starts acting. And I'm like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> I yeah. was not even really paying attention to, to the immediacy of what I was, what was, was going on. And the, I think the look on my face of utter surprise is, is because I was utterly surprised that I was supposed to be acting at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's such a pleasure to have you back, sir. It's um, this, this was, this was some good fun and, and insightful as, as always. And not only just um, more information about, about your place in the show, um, but your place out of the show as as well you know and and the an examination a little bit more of of the journey that we that we have to take um as creative beings so and i i appreciate you uh you uh, continuing to be so uh so open about it hey no problem i i i am forever devoted to to the fans obviously for making the show what it is we wouldn't have continued to make it had people not watched it and loved it. Mm. And um, yeah, I mean, a huge uh, debt of gratitude and, and thanks. So anything I can sort of do to help and continue to sort of support their interest um, and yours for being such a great uh, uh, go between uh, also being a fan yourself, but also just bringing the, the world of, of those of us behind the scenes to to the people who want to want to hear what we have to say. Well, I appreciate that. And there's there's a lot uh, more stories to tell. There's so many people behind the scenes that the people have not heard their names enough. And there uh, are a lot of those people who are uh, on our list for this particular show. And uh, you know, I mean, that's and a lot of them. You know, this uh, there's there's fewer years uh, ahead. Uh, than there are behind and it's like I've 
for me personally, there's some of them I've never spoken to. And it's like, you know, we've got to, we've got to get these, these stories out there. We've got to get some of these stories told. There's interesting stories about the shows that we love. So thank you. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I mean, look, I go, I've gone down the list of, of people who worked on the show, the cast list, the crew list on the show. It's just, it's unbelievable how long it is. And the, that, the older the show got, the more people, um, particularly actors, that we encountered while we were covering it were saying, my kids are fan of, fans of this show. So, or, you know, I, I really enjoy this show. So I'm doing this for my kids or I'm doing this for my own uh, personal satisfaction. I mean, I mean, Mel Harris, we're also going to be talking with her next, next month. Her son was a fan of the series, you know? And it's like, you've got these incredible actors. I will say one more, one more little thing. I think um, I wanted to remember to to say this. You can choose to put this in or not, but um, you know, I, I, uh, the show just, just uh, debuted on Netflix in the U S. Yes. I was so disappointed that they chose to use the original pilot. Uh, Brad went to such lengths to frankly, not just excise the nudity, but the, a number of the issues, he made the, a lot of the visual effects better. He fixed certain scenes. Joel's music. Uh, yeah, he just made the show better. <laughs> and for whatever reason, and I don't think it was intentional, I honestly think it's just someone grabbing the stuff off the shelf and not really thinking about it. Um, you know, put the original version out there. And, and it's just, I think it's a, frankly, a crime against the show that frankly families, you know, who have probably heard, oh, this is a great family show, tune in and see that pilot, which is not in any way reflective of the rest of the show. Now Showtime, and- Showtime insisted on the nudity for that episode. The, uh, I, people ask me every once in a while, why did they do that? It's like, it's not them. It was the network. You know, if they wanted to be on that network, is that not correct? Yeah, there was a little bit of the studio too. <laughs> oh, really? To be honest, yeah. I mean, Brad, you know, you should talk to Brad about this, but he, you know, he was the one who fought against it quite um, hard. And, and you know, I think there was this idea that the show was going to be, because it was based on a feature that it needed to be sort of R-rated or feel like it was, mm-hmm. you know, deserving of the, pay cable world it was um you know airing in uh but yeah i mean it just i i i think it is completely misrepresentative of the rest of the show and uh it's too bad because it's a show that families should watch and that kids should watch and has great values in it and i think i don't know you know the the it's like the intro is so um, wrong. The 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 attention to detail that the show um, sometimes gets is is not fair, and it seems like it gets passed on to to people who have to put something together. There is a there is a Blu-ray uh, release that's that's just been put out. Uh, and I'm just confirming this uh, with with the powers that be that that it is it is an authorized release and it's an upres. Jonas is on the cover of of the box art of of the four of the four leads for the complete series of SG One, and you you have to sit back and scratch your head and it's like okay whoever is doing this they're not they're either not getting the right people in or the people who are in are not asking the right questions for consistency for the show you put out the season 8 box set and you forget to put out the the um uh the the extended cut of of threads so i mean that's that's critical to so much of, okay i'm done <laughs> I mean, no i mean look that's a good one that we never talked about where i you know again i fought uh, long and hard to to keep the long version in existence. so crucial that yeah. whole Jaffa arc for eight seasons builds into that. Yeah, and uh, and then, I'm I, I'm I'm stunned about that Blu-ray. That's the first time hearing of it. But mm-hmm. I'll uh, send you the link. But I, you know, look, I can't say enough how disappointed I am in MGM for for uh, well, and perhaps I don't even know if Netflix was the, the requested it, but I have a feeling that nobody really thought twice about it. And the fact yeah. That, 
they just put it up and I'm just sick and tired of, you know, it doesn't happen all the time with this franchise, but, but it happens enough that it just really pisses me off. It's like, get, get people who know um, the content and know how they're approaching it. Cause it had an adult rating. It's like, that's not the show, you know? And this right. is a, a huge chance for it to shine and get new audiences. Put the friggin' final cut on the front of it. Right. Yeah, totally agree. So whatever you can do, if you can somehow rally the fans oh, we're doing to, to, uh, to, you know, slam the studio with emails and, and uh, tweets and what have you to, to try and get that to happen, we would fully support it. Absolutely. No, this is, this is, uh, a, a, and people are, people are, uh, fish are jumping in the boat, you know, finding, finding the show again. And if there's going to be ever a time, you know, this, this is it, especially with, with the fourth Stargate series, uh, possibly happening. So it's important. Yeah. Robert, right, well, you're, you're doing great work. Thank you. Thank you so much for everything and for your time. And, right. uh, I hope to talk to you again, uh, in 2021. Thanks everybody who's watching. My tremendous thanks to Robert C. Cooper for joining us once again on Dial the Gate. It's such a privilege to have him. He's so knowledgeable about the show and all, always for me takes takes it in surprising directions. You know, I, I've been lucky enough to know these people for the majority of my life and I'll sit down with them and I'll pose a question to them knowing, I think, uh, where their headspace is and it's just not <laughs> but it's always still fascinating because there's a reason for it and so we get uh, we, we get little glimpses of, of that throughout this show so thank you again Robert I have fan art in relation to heroes this is Janet and this is by Elemental Bubblegum I do like saying that name. As requested by user TigerJade86, a drawing of Janet Frazier from Stargate. I decided to add a little ascended touch to it with the wings and the whirly stuff in the background. I don't like the shading as much as my other drawing, especially with the scanned version. I don't think it's dark enough. The wing came out rather cool, though. We love you, Janet. Very cool. And Dial the Gate has a sponsor. We've partnered with 3D Tech Pro. For the month of December, to give you a chance to get your very own desktop Stargate and customized ancient keychain. To enter to win these items, you need to use a desktop or laptop computer and go to dialthegate.com. Scroll down to submit trivia questions. Your trivia may be used in a future episode of Dial the Gate, either for our monthly trivia night or for a special guest to ask me in a round of trivia. There are three slots for trivia, one easy, one medium, and one hard. Only one needs to be filled in, but you're more than welcome to submit up to three. Please note, the submission form does not currently work on mobile devices. Your trivia must be received before January 1st, 2021. That's a few days from now. If you're the lucky winner, I will be notifying you via your email right after the start of the new year to get your address and what word you want on your ancient keychain. Be sure to check out our partner's website for more Stargate-related merchandise at 3dtech.pro. If you like the show and what we're doing, please click that subscribe button. Uh, it makes a difference with YouTube's algorithm. It bolsters uh, the show in the search results um, and the like button, hitting the like button as well, particularly for uh, the search results. That makes that makes a big deal with the algorithm as well. Thank you so much to my production assistants, Jennifer Kirby and Linda Gategabber Fury. Thanks to my moderating team. You guys are aces, Summer, Ian, Tracy, Keith, and Jeremy. It has been a, a wonderful uh, first year for the show. I'm really glad to be uh, wrapping it up with Rob. And uh, you know what? We're going to see you in the next year with a lot of other fantastic guests. Just announced Mel Harris and uh, uh, Saul Rubinick. They're going to be joining us on Dial the Gate. I'm David Reed. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'll see you on the other side, literally. <laughs>